Hey guys, it's Ryan, and in this video we're going to look at, uh, sort of expand on the Action Potential video. If you haven't watched that, check that out on my channel. But this one we're going to look at how an Action Potential will um, get to a synaptic terminal, will signal a chain of events on another axon, which will signal a chain of events at a neuromuscular junction, where a neuron, a lower motor neuron specifically, meets a skeletal muscle. So let's, we have a lot to talk about, so let's get to it. So from the last video, we talked about how an action potential will sort of set off this trail of gunpowder and eventually get to a synaptic terminal. So this positive charge, which shouldn't be inside the axon, gets to the synaptic terminal. And then that sets off a chain of events where calcium enters the synaptic terminal causes vesicles to fuse at the membrane, at the presynaptic membrane, releasing some type of neurotransmitter that interacts with a receptor that then allows the influx of ions to continue this action potential or more accurately this depolarization event. So let's, let's talk about specific neurotransmitters. So you see here we have two uh, neurons synapsing on another neuron. So we could say these are maybe sensory neurons that are synapsing on a motor neuron or something like that. And let's say this one up here is exocytosing GABA, which is a one of the most popular inhibitory neurotransmitters. So this uh, receptor that receives it will allow the passage of something negative like chlorine ions to enter the cell. And so this, if we're thinking back to our action potential graph, this is going to make the resting membrane potential at this point, at this region, more negative. And so this will slowly propagate but will die down over over a certain distance. And over here, I already started drawing something positive, so let's say it allows the influx, this neurotransmitter, let's say, is um, our favorite acetylcholine, and it allows the influx of sodium. And so similarly, we'll have a positive depolarization event Propagate until it gets to the action potential until it gets to the axon hillock where there are the the highest concentration of of channels and that's where every action potential will take place. Now both of these events are called graded potentials because they're the result of an action potential on another neuron. So it's an, it starts out as an action potential becomes a graded potential and then if the excitatory graded potential is strong enough and is close enough to the axon hillock, then it will start another action potential down this neuron. So let's draw that. We'll have this positive depolarization peak moving down, moving down, and so this time we'll have similar similar events. So we'll have the voltage gated calcium channels open. We have calcium rush into the cell, and it can also come in from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is a big storage zone for them. And then this will cause the fusion of vesicles with the presynaptic membrane and we'll be releasing. So we'll draw that and then it'll release a neurotransmitter like acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. So this acetylcholine will bind to a receptor and will cause the influx of sodium into the cell. And now I'll pause for a moment and talk a little bit about this receptor. So this specific one at a skeletal muscle junction, the neuromuscular junction, is always a nicotinic acetylcholine or cholinergic receptor. 
And this means that it's ionotropic, which when we talked about in our transmembrane video, is like a ligand-gated ion channel. And specifically, the nicotinic cholinergic receptor is a nonspecific cation channel. So it lets not just sodium across, but all positive ions, including potassium. But because the equilibrium or the resting membrane potential is farther from the equilibrium potential for sodium, it's sort of like the seesaw is closer to the potassium equilibrium potential. So when you take off all restrictions, it's going to move, it's going to swing back more towards the sodium. So it's going to allow more sodium to pass through into the skeletal muscle. So this is essentially another depolarization event. And so this depolarization event moves across, moves down deep into the skeletal muscle. And this is because the sarcolemma or plasma membrane of a, of a skeletal muscle has T tubules, transverse tubules that dive deep into the cell. So it enables this, this depolarization event to, to move deep into the cell. And there it will activate not just cation channels, but specific voltage-gated sodium channels, which we know are intimately related with depolarization. So now we have a really strong positive charge at this, at this membrane. So now at this point, we have something called a DHP receptor, also called L-type calcium channel, which is a little misleading because it's not actually a channel, it's more like a voltage sensor. So when it senses this depolarization event, it signals its friend, the ryanodyne receptor, on a nearby sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is just a smooth endoplasmic reticulum for muscle. So this DHP voltage sensor signals the ryanodyne sensor, a ryanodyne receptor, and this will release calcium, lots of calcium, into the muscle. Now at this point, this calcium binds to troponin, which is one of the four main protein or, or main myofilament components of muscle. So cal when calcium binds to troponin, it releases this tropomyosin thin strip from blocking binding sites on these actin beads. So I think of it kind of like a, a nerd's rope, and the nerd's candy are these little actin beads, and, and the rope part is this tropomyosin. And this troponin is, is literally pulling away the tropomyosin, freeing the little, um, the little nerd candy beads. And so when this happens, the little extensions on this thick myosin filament can reach out, grab, grab hold of an actin filament, and then when it does that, it can flick towards the midline of a sarcomere, and it'll slide this actin filament towards the midline, essentially causing contraction of the muscle. Now when calcium starts, or when this contraction event is over, calcium starts leaving the cell in a, in a couple of different ways. So calcium can be mostly be thrown back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this occurs via a circa pump. So let's draw that in here. So the circa pump located on a sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane actively pumps calcium back in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it does so with an ATPase activity. So this is an example of primary active transport. And there are also receptor or also transporters on the on the actual membrane of the cell that can pump out calcium from the cell. And now we can also talk about these receptors in the neuron, 
for these transporters in the neuron because there's also a circa pump which can pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here we have this circa pump. And then here we have the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. And this is the same exact function, except this time it's pumping it out of the cell completely. And then we can also have calcium sodium antiporters, which are an example of secondary active transport, because we're taking advantage of the fact that we have high sodium outside the cell, and so this receptor can use the energy stored in that gradient, pump sodium into the neuron, and then pump calcium out of the neuron. So it's called antiporter because it's doing this, this counter transport, moving one thing in, moving another thing out. And as I said, these same receptors are located on the muscle as well. Once calcium leaves the cell, then the troponin snaps back, the tropo tropomyosin snaps back, and covers the actin, and so the myosin can no longer bind to it, and the muscle relaxes. So I know that was a lot, but I hope this video is helpful, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.